Hello, I'm Dapper Dan Gavazdan, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which I say definitely count. Ooh, well, I'm mischievous Mark Chinacchio, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, but I say the annuals do not count, Dan. Welcome to Kamsa. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for the second episode of Season 6 of The Amazing Spider Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, and fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe. And boy, do we have a fun one for you guys today. Yeah, if you want to swing along with us on our journey through Spidey's past, present, and future, subscribe to Amazing Spider Talk on your favorite podcast app. This podcast exists because of support of our Patreon members. If you want to receive early episodes, exclusive artwork, and keep this podcast going, go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and consider joining our Patreon. In this season of The Amazing Spider Talk, we're going to be going back to the mid-80s when The Amazing Spider-Man title was handed over to one of the most legendary creative pairings in comics. They would even call themselves that. Mm. Yes, it is Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends. It's a time of immense change in the comics industry, but together, Tom and Ron return Spider-Man to its Ditko-inspired roots to create one of the most beloved runs on the title. So, uh, as, as we insinuate, today we're going to be joined by the legendary Tom DeFalco and the equally legendary Ron Friends for the first time together on The Amazing Spider Talk. We specifically wanted to talk to them about their unique partnership in comics that has lasted four decades. Together, they've worked on Amazing Spider-Man, Spider-Girl, Marvel Team-Up, Thor, Thunderstrike, so much more. So many excellent titles, and they're going to talk about their process, their friendship, their bond together on our show. Dan, this is very exciting stuff. Yeah, I'm so thrilled about about this conversation because, like like I said, you know, uh, first of all, they're one of the best team ups ever in 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 creative forces and comics, and we've had them on the show so many times, but independently of each other. So I I was so thrilled that we got to, them to come on together. Uh, for this one and I think you begin to see what makes them like work as creative partners uh, during this conversation so you know whatever as much as fun as it is to listen to you and I talk it's more fun to listen to Ron and Tom talk so let's get right to the interview well now let's meet one of our amazing spider friends the kind of guy I go to other friends who recommend find out about the things they created you'll love them so much that you wish you dated but you're just friends they're an amazing friend, a friend, a friend, a friend. They're an amazing friend. All right, Dan. Well, we have two people on right now who are certainly not strangers to the show, but shockingly, especially given what we're going to talk to them about, this is the first time we've had them both on together at the same time in the same room or virtual room. So uh, a very <laughs> special welcome to the legendary Tom DeFalco and the equally legendary Ron <laughs> Friends. Uh, thank you for, for, for joining us. I mean, we are uh, embarking on a season where we're going to be talking a lot about your initial run on Amazing Spider-Man. But what we really wanted to talk to you about today was was this very unique partnership that you had. And, you know, we felt like we couldn't do it without both of you together. You know, we, we have to see the chemistry in person. So thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> the chemistry in person, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, because yeah, Tony and I don't usually do these kind of things together. So Tom, Tom and I don't usually do these together. Uh, so it's it's a it's a pleasure to see you again after these fifteen twenty years, Mister Falco. Yes, <laughs> we, we haven't spoken in what, has it been years, or, or, or was it on I, Friday? It was. It was. It was yeah. <laughs> one or the other <laughs> well, uh, well I, you know on on that note there there are so few collaborators in comics that have enjoyed the kind of relationship you both have had uh, both in time and volume uh I, I'm, but i'm curious like uh, we have not discussed it with you before how did you guys meet and establish your working relationship with each other uh, I, I think we met at, at a pittsburgh convention uh, or some other convention at one point. Um, well, you had hired me on uh, as, as editor on Team Up. 
But did did and, I hire uh, you before we met? I, that was yeah. I think when we met, we already had that editor freelancer relationship. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I, I got a call from Tom, and he was the new editor, or or he was at, at the editor of Team Up. So when he uh, uh, he had seen my version of Spider Man in uh, Kesar, and uh, figured I didn't destroy fifty years of continuity, <laughs> so. Maybe I could do some team ups for him, so I, I did a couple of fill ins for him, uh, and was it doesn't really look like it, but I was the regular guy on team up for a while. That poster that people have seen that was in the stores, that it was a big Spider Man and the entire Marvel Universe poster. I penciled it, uh, Mike Esposito inked it because we were you know at some point the regular team on on uh, Marvel team up, which. All told, I think ended up being maybe what six issues or something before, before Danny came in and before we were hired on Amazing, you know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that was during that transition too. But in person, we met at a, a smaller Pittsburgh show along with Butch Geis, and we went out to dinner and talked about comics as as we do, and found out that we enjoyed the same things about Marvel and about. The, you know, the way Stan structured things and hoo-ha comics and fun and soap opera and, and you know, and, and keeping it interesting and, and keeping it fun. Because that, that was around the time in the 80s where, you know, we, it was becoming the age of the anti-hero and things. And, mm. uh, so it was nice to meet somebody who wasn't trying to get more, you know, cinematic or more adult or more bloody or more, you know to find a, a kindred spirit who enjoyed hoo-ha action and angst <laughs> in the mighty Marvel manner was a pleasure. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, Ron and I were really on the same page. We, as he said, we liked the same stuff. So, you know, we, we worked together well. So, so how do you maintain that friendship and working relationship with each other? I mean, you know, Dan and I, we know a lot about collaborations, obviously. And I mean, I don't know if I can maintain a friendship with him the way you guys do. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it goes both ways, buddy. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, see, one of us actually has a, has a real nice personality and is a really good guy. Um, <laughs> And, and I'm a bit of a stiff. Uh, so, <laughs> Sounds familiar. No. <laughs> I, mean, I, won't, I won't lie. I would, I would say that one of the things that's helped our partnership in the same way it's probably helped your partnership is we, we live in separate states. You know? Uh, you know, we're, not, we're not sharing an office or getting on each other's nerves or, you know, getting overly personal you know, we, we've been through a lot of, both of us have been through a lot together. in the course of our friendship. But, uh, you know, we, we, we don't, if, if you start getting sick and tired of somebody, you just hang up the phone and don't call them for a couple of days. You know, I, I think a lot of marriages would last forever in a day if the man and the woman could just <laughs> go to neutral corners. Speaking of which, if the man and the woman could go to seriously neutral corners and, you know, or have their own homes or their own houses, their own wings, where they could regroup, you know, that kind of thing and be together when you really want to be together. I dare not comment upon that, that statement. As much a part of it is any. Well, that the fact that for the longest time he was my boss. <laughs> so, uh, and, and a very generous one at that. But I mean, he's always been, I, I don't it, it really has to do with, I think the I think the, the partnerships that have lasted last because of a of a uh, serious need for a lack of ego. If you if you genuinely respect the person you're working with and what they bring to the table, and and have your own ego under control, there's no reason that a partnership can't flourish for for decades. You, you know, the friendship kind of happens by accident along the way mm. from. Exposure. <laughs> that kind of I, I guess you so. find out that when, when you do have the rare opportunities to be in a room together, you find out, wow, I, 
I like this person too. That's really cool. You know. Well, Tom, now it's your opportunity to take it out on Ron. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, what Ron said um, when when we started, you know, throwing ideas together, we we we. Our, we both had the same goal, which was to do the best story we could. Um, and, you know, Ron would throw his ideas in a pot. I'd throw mine ideas, my ideas in a pot. We, we did it with to totally without ego. And, and one of the things that's great about working with Ron um, is that, you know, he, he's an idea factory. Uh, he just comes up with idea after idea after idea. And so if... Uh, you know, if, if we're trying to put put a story together and both of us are just coming up with I ideas and we're not married to any any of them, um, at some point we find something that we both like and and you know we both we both end up having the same reaction. Hey that hey that's cool or I never saw that before and we get excited about it. And and I've always, <laughs> and I've always thought that if the creative people get excited about a story, the readers are going to have to get excited too. Um, and that's you know kind of been it. You know, Ron and I. Yeah, we've stayed, we've stayed fans enough that we definitely write for ourselves. We we definitely write, we create a book that we would want to read ourselves. Uh, there there is no. You know, template that we follow that has nothing to do with what we wouldn't enjoy reading. I, I wish there was more material out there the way we do it because then I'd be reading more stuff. He's currently working on a project with Pat Olive, and I can't wait for it to hit the racks because I'll finally have something to read. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I I agree with with all of that. I mean, the you know the interesting part about it too that I I never found with some other people that I, that I have had the opportunity to partner with is if I pitch an idea and Tom doesn't think it works, he'll tell me why he does, why it doesn't work, whether, whether it's a continuity thing that I forgot about or whether it's, you know, I, I when, when I, when I first came back on the spider girl after Pat's incredible run, uh, I was pitching a lot of ideas, but most of them were MC two ideas that I had had sitting around or, always wanted to see happen with this generation of characters, but they weren't spider girl ideas. And the name of the book is spider girl. So, you know, Tom would occasionally have to rein me in and say, that's a neat idea. Is there some way we can make it a spider girl idea? <laughs> and if we could great. And if we couldn't fine. and sooner or later, I got, I got my head around it. And you know, the amazing spider girl run, I'm very proud of, because I think we were, we were pumping on all cylinders on the Amazing Spider Girl run, as much, any, as, even as much as we were on on the Amazing Spider Man run, and and the best of our Thor stuff. So, uh, I, I still, I mean, it's still a great fun working with Tom. I always, it, because it, it is a tone that is the the type of story that we enjoy doing. The way we enjoy handling the characters and the way we see the characters is all very simpatico so you know I, I sit down and read a plot the way I used to way back on Spider-Man I remember my first reaction every time I read a Tom plot was there's no way this is going to fit into 22 pages <laughs> and it always did it always fit great and we had it but we we didn't have a lot of wasted space either we didn't have you know five pages of talking heads ever you know that kind of thing was there a point in time at marvel where you guys uh specifically requested to work with each other or was that something that grew naturally when others note began to notice how well you worked together um i think that was actually if you put together we got fired off of spider-man <laughs> right but we spent months not you know not a team right and you were going to get hired on Thor anyway. Uh, well, no. <laughs> yeah. See, um, I, at a certain point for, uh, you know, uh, crazy reasons, I was sent to England to deal with the Marvel UK K branch. And then when I came back from England, um, I hadn't been doing much writing for Marvel during that period of time. 
And, um, and I, I think Ron and I started to talk and, and we had heard that Daredevil was, uh, was coming open. And we started to talk about putting together a pitch for Daredevil. And uh, I remember going into Ralph Macchio's office and saying, you know, Ralph, that he's the editor of, of Daredevil. You know, uh, Ron and I would like to, to do a pitch for, for Daredevil. Have you decided on your creative team yet? He says, no, no. He says, you guys would be great for Daredevil. Um, and he said, but I really can't think about Daredevil now because I'm really, I'm really stuck. Thor is very late and I need a, I, I desperately need a Thor film. He says, do you think you guys could do a Thor film? And I said, yeah, we could probably do a film for any book on the line. Figuring, yeah, you know, a one shot Thor film. So we did a Thor film. I don't remember which one, one it was. It was either the Secret Wars. Well, then the Secret Wars one. You always say that. Okay. Yeah, I'm, yeah I don't remember. <laughs> Featured the Enchantress and happened during the Secret Wars. All right. So we did the Secret Wars one. And as we're finishing, you know, up on that, because we did that fairly quickly, um, I said to Ralph, so you want to hear our Daredevil pitch? He says, not, not yet, because Thor's still really like, could you... Any chance you could do a second Thor villain? And I said, uh, yeah, I guess. And then we did the once in future Thor because our, our goal was to do villains that didn't impact continuity. Um, that's why we did the Secret Wars. That's why we did the future Thor. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I, I, as we were working on that or getting towards the end of that, Ralph said to me, Okay, I want you guys to do a book. And I said, Daredevil. And he said, no. He said, no, Thor. And I said, we can't do Thor. We don't do Cosmic. And he said, you just did two issues. And I said, but they're, they're, they're fillings. And he said, no, no, no. I, I, you know, I think you guys could do it. Um, but at the time, Sal was the regular penciler on Thor. And... Um, and I, I, I remember somebody said to me, well, just, you know, just call up Sal, tell him uh, you come with your own pencil. <laughs> <laughs> I said, There's no way I'm calling up Sal Buscema and tell him you're off Thor because I come with my own pencil. I mean, give me a break. Um, but then uh, Jim Salakrup happened to overhear the conversation. He says, hey, listen, um, w would it be okay if I uh, offered Sal one of the Spider-Man books. And I said, y y you want Thou Sal on the Spider-Man book? He says, yeah. He says, I, I, you know, I'd kill for Sal on the Spider-Man book. So I said, let's leave it up to Sal. So he called up Sal and said, would you rather draw Thor or Spider-Man? He says, oh, definitely Spider-Man. <laughs> and, 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 and then Sal went to, went to Spider-Man and that's how Ron and I ended up on Thor. Um, and, uh, you so know, would you, would we, you say that that was the point where you guys kind of as a creative team were like locked in for the long haul? Like, did that feel like we're like officially a partnership on multiple books at this point? I, I, you know, I don't know if I, ever... I still don't feel that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Cause I, I do know that at, at one point, uh, while we were on Thor, uh, Grunwald came to us, you know, he came to me and he said to me, um, how would you and Ron like to do Captain America? Um, and I thought, oh, I, I, you know, Captain America is my dream book. I'd love to do Captain America. Um, and I know that Ron loves Captain America too, but we just started around the time of the Eric Masterson stuff. Mm. And, and um, you know, I called Ron and, and I said to him, you know, what do you think? And, and he said, you, you could tell me what he said, Ron. <laughs> well, actually, I remember it a little bit differently. I remember it being after Thunderstrike started. Oh, after Thunderstrike started? I don't know. Because I had, I had a conversation with Ralph uh, about uh, Thunderstrike. Because at that point, I wasn't sure because I, we, we were so committed to what we were doing. I didn't want to try doing two books a month. It might have been possible, but I wouldn't have been able to 
give full attention to either title. And we were very invested in Thunderstrike. And then it was, unfortunately, you know, all the Perlman crap happened and Thunderstrike was canceled for the stupid reasons it was canceled. Uh, and there was nothing Ralph could do about it, but it was one of those, I remember it being one of those moments where I felt ridiculous because, you know, it's like, oh boy, if only, if only you had a crystal ball, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Ron, you, you alluded to this um, a few minutes ago, the, 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 the Marvel style or the house style and you know we've we've heard about marvel method we we hear about full script so just just once and for all what what is the the falco friends method of creating comics what, what, what who who does what it's the it's the it's the marvel method it is we we get on the phone and we talk about ideas and once an idea gels and we get a theme and we get a we get something that'll make a good 22 pages tom goes and structures it as a plot and gets it into the 22 pages and hands it to me and i pencil it and as i'm penciling it sometimes other ideas occur to me and i'll put them in liner notes or call him up and say hey what about this and he goes great and we stay you know we we uh, keep refining the idea let's say and uh and then it goes back to him the script and he finds things in the script that weren't you know that might necessarily have been in the pencils and and it becomes this finished product that is hopefully the best effort of not just us but an inker and a colorist and a letterer and an editor uh and that's you know whether whether there's a lot of typing paper involved or whether there's a handshake or a phone call or, or, a, or somebody jumping up, acting out something on an office desk, it, that's the Marvel method, is collaboration. Is, you know, not just a cold, full script that is handed to somebody the writer may never meet, and then he does his gig, and then it's, you know, handed off, and neither one of them sees it again until it's printed. Mm -hmm. You know, that that is more the corporate DC version, which is unfortunately the way the industry is pretty much right now. Uh, just because all the Marvel guys started to, started to age out and get fired and leave and nobody was around them to really keep it alive, you know, keep it, uh, keep, keep it alive well. I mean, DeFalco went over to DC for a while there during the New 52 and was producing plots and he was working with a lot of young illustrators that looked at his plots and had no idea what to do with a plot. <laughs> so mm. they called in guys like me and Scott McDaniel and I believe like Carl Potts or, you know, I have a couple of guys, uh, you know, expats from Marvel called them in to, to do layouts for these young kids because they were, they were struggling with the blank page. Does that method, um, you guys talked about like setting your ego aside, like I could see that method, you know, contributing to like ego conflict, like not wanting to let go of something, um, you know, uh, but for you guys, does that method kind of help reinforce this idea of keeping your ego out of it? Because there's going to be another set of hands on it, you know, at some point down the line. Working Marvel style, you, you kind of stay involved. I mean... You know, my, my, my situation with Tom doesn't dictate my situation with anchors, but in most cases, you know, working with Al Milgram for a long period of time, working with Brett Breeding, working with Joe Sinnott, if there was a question or a comment or if I'm looking at my Xeroxes, oh, this was always Sal's favorite thing. If I was looking at my Xeroxes and saw something I forgot or something I screwed up on, he always loved it when I called him because he could bust my balls about it. <laughs> you know, he could always... Yeah, well, Ron, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure I could redraw your artwork. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. If you're not going to do it right, I guess one of us has to. You know? <laughs> he always had great pleasure in, uh, in giving me a hard time about it. But he, he was, of course, at Salva Sama, so he was able to fix anything, any, anything I screwed up. But, you know, that, that's a separate part of it. But for us, any of our longer runs, it's always been a team effort. It's not just Tom and I, separate from the anchor, and even, the, I mean, because Tom was in the office for most of it, 
So he was connected to even the colorists and the letterers and all that guy because Mike Rockwitz was working in the office at the time anyway, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Rick Parker was our letterer for the longest time, and and Mike Rockwitz, and I mean we've always had we've always had such a team atmosphere on the books we've worked on that when we launched Thunderstrike, everybody wanted to go with us. <laughs> Al Milgram, the anchor, and Rick Parker, yeah. the letterer, and. Uh, 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 I just said his name. Uh, Mike Rockwitz. Um, Mike Rockwitz, our colorist. Everybody went over to Thunderstrike with us, which was unheard of. I mean, it, it, why wouldn't they just stay on the nice stable Thor title that they were pulling a regular paycheck on? You know, that kind of thing. So it's always been very gratifying that, you know, we, plus the fact Tom believes that if you're trying to write 12 issues a month, Take ideas from anybody. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, Al Williamson, when he was inking Pat Olive, when I really like this one character. Are we going to see her again? Are we going to do more with her? You bet we are. You know, <laughs> there you go. So when you when you start on a creative run together, now I know, you know, you just described a couple of the, you know, your first runs with Marvel were kind of fill-ins, but... I guess when you're when you're bestowed the comic officially, I don't know if there's a ceremony or not. Probably not. Uh, what are some of the first conversations? No, no, no. no, no. There's it, a, it's, a, it's a lot like a breast. Yeah, 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 it's, it's a, a lot like a ceremony. Sort of that sort of stuff. Uh, <laughs> they take more, but they give it back when they fire. Right, you right. Know. But but, right. but 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 what are those first conversations about? When you're, I mean, are you like laying the groundwork? Are you setting goals? Are you establishing how you're going to work? Like, what is it? What is it? No, it's it's always about the character. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we spent hours and hours on the phone talking about people that don't exist, <laughs> as if they do, uh, and how we, you know, through our own filters, how we've always seen Peter Parker, how we've always seen his relationship with Aunt May, how we've always seen his relationship with Mary Jane, you know, how we've seen Mary Jane. We just compared notes and. And talk about the characters, and you know, that reminds me of somebody I knew when I was in high school. You know, that kind of thing, and and we would try to firm up a a, a, a firm vision between the two of us, based on all the other work that everybody else had done on that character, as to who these characters are and how they feel about things that we might put them through. You know, that kind of thing, and. With, with Thor, I remember the first conversation we had was basically just how we saw the character and what we thought was unique about the character. And and we decided pretty quickly that we definitely wanted to keep the, the Earth-Asgard ratio more even and ultimately reestablish a, 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 an Earth identity form. Mm. Because I, we always felt that the, the, the real interesting fascinating thing about thor is his relationship with us with with mortals is that uh, from all the asgardians he finds us worthy of respect and awe and he's he's amazed by we idiots <laughs> and uh part of that is because of the don blake connection but also part of it is just because he's spent time around us and he and he's worked with the avengers He's met Captain America, so he he has a different view than the rest of the Asgardians do. And to bring that home, we really wanted to reintroduce uh, a human identity, and we didn't want to go back to Don Blake because Don Blake never really existed. Mm. So we wanted to, to do the merger thing. We planned that way out in the head, but that was one of our early ideas that we just played the slow game on because we decided... Uh, Tom being a genius writer, he decided that, you know, before you merge them, let's introduce Eric and actually get to the point where the readers like Eric mm -hmm. for himself, who this guy is and, and that he's got, he's got the guts, but not the guns, you know, to do it. <laughs> and so that when we merge them, nobody's offended. Nobody thinks we're, you know, cutting Thor in half or anything like that. And it ended up working in our favor to do that, to, to play the long game on it with Eric. And, uh, you know, I can think of uh, dozens of examples like that where 
we, you know, we had ideas early on that were not meant for the first six issues because we were going to play the long game on it. Because back then, if you got hired to do a title, we had spinner racks. We had sales. <laughs> you could do a goofy Christmas issue and not worry about your sales falling to the point that you get canceled the next month. Yeah. You know, you didn't live with that paranoid sort of Damocles over your head every month. Thank God, because that's that can't be any fun. And and sales could actually grow on titles. And 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 they did in fact grow. Um, you know, we were very Yeah, that, that was back when if you had a regular team that was coming back every month and there was consistency month to month in a title, you built numbers. Mm -hmm. You built an audience. Because if somebody said, Hey, have you seen what's going on at Thor? I've really been enjoying the last couple of issues and somebody goes and checks it out, it's still the same people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and they can say, oh, you're right. Yeah, this is kind of fun. And it's not just going to be for six issues or 12 issues or a two-year arc or anything like that. You know, it, it's this is the book until it's not the book yeah. anymore. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, so it was a very different time in that way as well. Yeah. 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 And, and just the, the kind of relationship you had with your audience was different. And a lot, a lot of what we did were one issue stories, two issue stories. Occasionally, we do three issue stories. We we realized that our attention span would start to lag after three issues. So yeah, I think three issues was was the maximum for us. I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're drawing the same characters and the same backgrounds and the same environments and everything for more than two or three issues. You're ready for something fresh. You're ready for that character to move on to something else. You know, one of my pet peeves with the movie guys, as great a job as they do generally, is when they have that attitude of, you know, Iron Man 2 rolled around, and the comic really didn't show us much of a path forward. So we had to come up with it ourselves. And it's like, are you out of your mind? At that point, there were 40, 50 years worth of Iron Man comics. <laughs> yeah. You know, what are you talking about? <laughs> You know, and as much as I admire and think Chris Hemsworth has done a terrific job for the most part on Thor, you know, for him to say that he gets bored after playing Thor the same way in two movies, it's like we wrote the character for like, what, seven or eight years. We never got bored. What is the matter with you people? <laughs> yeah, right. And he's not even working all year on it. He's doing like three months here and there. It's nuts. Yeah. It's nuts. It's a. I don't understand that attitude because you can be consistent with the character and still put him through his paces and put him into different situations and have him react in different ways. And, you know, I mean, certainly I don't agree with every Marvel Comics treatment of Thor. I mean, they we now let the creatives decide who the character is every six issues or every two years or something. And I don't necessarily... Uh, you know, agree with every permutation of the character, but that's what makes horse races too. That's what makes some runs of books sell better than other runs of books. Is you know, certainly Walt came in and had a different take on Thor, and everybody loved him. Mm. You know, uh, our our decision when we got on hired on the book was: Are we going to try to be a bad Walt substitute and fail, or are we going to go back to you know? some of the Lee and Kirby stuff that we really identified with, and for me, even the Jerry Conway stuff, and take what we can from Walt and from those guys and build our own Thor, our own approach to Thor, and, uh, and, and do the best job we can via that. Um, one of the things I've always appreciated about your collaborations is how much, like you're saying, you go back to character at the essence of it and, and even go back to the source material. Um, you, you once said to us on the show that you would refer to Peter as Pete, like you were intimate friends with the guy. Um, and I'm curious, you know, on that note, you know, do you ever feel like you uh, project your own friendship with each other, uh, you know, into the development of these characters in the comics? Like, do, do you feel like that friendship you've developed has found its way onto the page? That's a, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. I think a lot of the warmth of Spider-Girl um, you know, comes from 
you know, the friendship that we, we had and, and the friendship, you know, with Pat. Um, the, you know, uh, you know, Spider Girl was a real family book. And uh, Ron and I both have a great respect for family. I, I rarely have been involved with anybody who is a comics fan. I've, in fact, I've never been involved with anybody who's a comics fan. Uh, I would, you know, I would like to, to meet a woman where I said, you know, if you read <clears throat> A Next and if you read our <laughs> Eric Masterson stuff and if you read Spider Girl, you'll get to know me, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I've never had that opportunity. I never, I never, I never was. Well, we can all but, dream. But, right? <laughs> But the uh, the interesting thing too is that I think it has it, it's reflective of I, I think our friendship and our respect for each other in the work is reflected in the characters being generally uh, well-adjusted, well-meaning people. Uh, there was nothing in Eric Masterson. The only thing about Eric Masterson that wasn't Tom or I is the fact that he was a single dad. Mm -hmm. and, and my brother was a single dad at the time. So, you know, those, we, we write what we know. We write what we've seen and experienced and, and have taken in. Um, when Hercules was a regular in Thor, those scenes with Hercules and Eric, when Eric finally gave up Kevin, come on, man. <laughs> that, you know... Real men hug, and real men feel like their heart's been ripped yeah, out. Yeah. And, you know, those are things that, you know, you know, Tom and I never had a discussion where it was, well, you can't have your lead character. Burst you know, into tears. Pissy, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, we're, we're very simpatico when it comes to that kind of thing as well. So, you know, that, that speaks to, you know, where we can find the humor in these characters and where we can find the humanity in these characters. And, and, and that's, that's different from just treating them like action figures. You know, I mean, you, you don't want to do that. You don't want to get to a point where, you know, the only, you know, the one note character where, you know, well, what's, what's the deal with your character? He, you know, strikes first and asks questions later. Well, that's going to get really boring after a while, you know. So, uh so I think in that way, all of our characters are are somewhat of a distillation of Tom and I, you know. Um, we were very fortunate. I mean, Tom has talked about it in other interviews that a lot of this conflict between Pete and uh, Mayday in Spider-Girl were things that he observed between his, his brother and niece, you know. We all use life like that, you know. I've I wish some of my friends read my work because there are things they say that show up in the book. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, well, there was a girl I dated that she always, she and her mom always were very proud of their attitudes, or their, their liberated attitudes towards men and everything. And, and one of her favorite sayings was a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. <laughs> and we used it in spider girl. Davida said it to May Day as something that her grandmother used to say, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, so that's where we get our material is from our friends and our lives. And, and uh, you know, so, so much of it makes it in there. And so, yes, our friendship absolutely uh, influences how we handle these characters. Maybe, maybe this is more of a Tom question or a Ron question. I don't know. But I was going to ask about with new characters. When you're developing a new character, what was, um, what, what's kind of the creative method there for the for the two of you? Is it is it name and characteristics first? Is it design first? How do, how does the collaboration kind of work when it comes to developing a new character? It you know, I I I think whether it's a new character or an old character or whatever, we just you know put our heads together and try to figure out who is this person. And, that, and, you know, Ron alluded to it, but we try to look at, at each character as if they're a real person and try to get them to act like real people as opposed to the standard comic book character. 
like like Ron said when when um, when we were doing you know Spider Girl in the beginning, and Peter Parker found out his daughter was playing Spider Spider Girl, he reacted very badly to that. Um, and you know, Mary Jane said to him, "Wait, when you were when you were a teenager, you were doing the same thing." Yeah, and he said like any of us would have, but I knew what I was doing. Right. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it's okay for me to risk my life as a teenager, but God forbid my my precious daughter should risk her life as a teenager. Now, a lot of comic book fans couldn't, you know, just couldn't accept that. They kept thinking we had no idea of who Peter Parker was uh, because yeah, he had been Spider-Man. Of course he would support his daughter right away. Yeah, right. <laughs> A cat, a cat. Well, those were all those. What? Those were all the readers who weren't fathers. <laughs> those were all the readers that weren't fathers. You know, you know, a a character, an action figure, reacts, you know, by the numbers. A real person, you know, ha has more of an emotional connection to it. And yeah. and, and now I'm going to give you another complaint I had. <laughs> when. When Spider Girl first came out, you know, it was said 15 years in the future, which was uh, 2013, because <laughs> it came out in, in, in uh, 1998. And everybody, I can't tell you how many reviews we had. People were complaining, it's set in the future. Where are the flying cars? <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculous. Yeah, because we were, we were still there. I, I think part of it was we were competing with Batman Beyond, mm. where an 80-year-old Bruce and they still have you know skyscrapers that have not yet to be built mm. and uh, flying cars and all that kind of stuff. Because yeah, in one generation, give me a break. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I remember at one point I was having that discussion with a fan, and I said, "Wait a minute, think 15 years ago. Are things really all that different?" And he went, "Oh, I get your point." Yeah, they really are, aren't they? I went, no, <laughs> no. No, my point is they're not. I mean, you know, phones might be smaller, but, you know, microwaves still work. Uh, you know, people are still... I, I used to see things in Time Magazine, that, like trending fashion things, and I would include them in Spider-Girl, and wouldn't you know, the only ones I ever included were things that never got <laughs> you know. One was that young girls were going to start wearing these, like, straps around right below the knee that would be like pant bottoms, but they'd wear them with skirts so that the top of their legs would be bare, and then from the, from the knee down, there'd, there'd be a pant leg. And I drew DeVito wearing them in an issue, and sure as hell, they never went anywhere. That never caught on. You know, I mean, so few things ever do. But, you know, the people that criticize us for any of that stuff, not only does the future not happen that quickly, things are also on a wheel and stuff comes back around. You know, I mean, elephant jeans, elephant pant leg jeans came back for a while there, you know, and, and uh, bare midriffs are, have left and come back already since spider Girl. Because Bear Midriffs were all when when Pat was drawing the book, Bear Midriffs were all the rage, even in high schools. And he 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 drew Mayday wearing that a few times. I drew Mayday wearing that in the in one hundred five in the original appearance. I had her wearing a, a top with a Bear Midriff, and then they went out of style completely. And now they're coming back. Now I now I see them on TV again, and I see them coming back again. And it's like what the, you know. Whatever. I remember on January 1st, 2013, Ron called me up and said, it's, it's now 15 years. Where's my freaking flying car? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so when you do sit down, like you, you've talked to us before about the, like the deck of cards, you know, designing the, the characters from the Spider-Man run and, and, and things like that. Um, but like when you do actually sit down to do come up with these characters, like the, the ones you've invented whole cloth, you know, is it name and characteristics first? D does Ron take a whack at the design and that helps firm up who they are as a person? Like what, what's the collaboration like? Um, it's all kinds of different things. Yeah. Uh, 
if Tom has the idea, sometimes he'll come up with a you know a, a little write up that reads a lot like a Marvel Universe handbook you know write up or something. That's what he did with Silver Sable and with Puma, who came from the Animal Cards. Um, if it's a character that that, that I've had kicking around in my head, I'll send him the visual and say, you know, do you think there's anything we could do with this? And the name might change or some of the visual might adjust to to wherever we're going. I don't think we've ever just sat there and went, you know, it'd be a cool character. It's always like, what do we need for the next story? Mm, yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, Eric was very specific to, we wanted to create this other identity for Thor uh, you know, uh, uh, to contrast and compare and be metaphorical with and everything, which is why he was a single father. Um, and Spider Girl, of course, was you know a spinoff of the Spider Man character. I mean, so yeah, I guess, I guess the only characters we create from whole cloth really are the villains, mm -hmm. and usually they're to serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, Mister uh, Right. Mm -hmm. Oh well, yeah, okay, yeah. We, well, but that was yeah, that was like one of the only times that we've. So so, what do we want to do if we're going to do a, a a new Tom DeFelco Ron Friends character? What do we want to do? And I that the first thing we decided what we were we wanted to do a an athlete character. We wanted to do a Captain America Daredevil kind of guy, not cosmic powered, but you know one of those tumbling. Uh, who jumps into 15 guys and <laughs> comes out, you know, all that kind of stuff. We, that, that's, you know, we, that was the first thing we decided. But the name and a red and white version of the character was somebody that I had come up with for an incidental character in MC2. Just during some period of time, it was out of an old sketchbook, um, and his costume was different. We, I reworked the costume over and over and over again until we came up with what, what we ended up with, both liking. But, uh, but yeah, the name, uh, you know, calling a character Mr. Wright was, was something that I had as an incidental background character in the MC2 universe that we never got around to. And uh, it just seemed a great thing to, to build on. When it comes to those villains, you know, do, Tom, when you're coming up with this plot, like, do you, like, come up with a scenario and then try to find the right villain for that thing? You know, like, I need Spider-Man to face off against a overwhelming threat or a, a businessman of some kind. Does that come first or is it really more kind of like in the ether, uh, you know, that these things kind of shake up? You know, I think I think it's kind of organic. I think, you know, Ron and I. Sometimes we we know what what the theme is, and we know what we want to accomplish in the, in the story. And then as we talk about it, you know, the villain slowly kind of takes shape. Um, just like a, a lot of times, there, there there have been times when the next issue is coming and and. You know, I have no ideas on, on what, what what we're going to do next issue. Um, and and Ron doesn't, and we start talking, and uh, you know, an hour or so later, we've got a fully fully formed story. I think the important thing to bring up here too is that we are not working in in a vacuum. We are hired to play in the best sandbox ever created in, in a for a fictional universe. And so as a, as a fan from the time I was a kid, I mean, there are always, well, I've always liked to draw this. I've always wanted to draw this villain. So you've always got that to pull from. Um, I remember a story I read in 1974 that this really resonated with me because this character said this to that character. And, you know, that's something I would love to, to do something like or revisit with those characters or, or whatever, you know, that, uh, we, you know, we're, we're playing off of, we're building on the shoulders of Titans and it's, 
you know, you can't separate that from from the process because the process is you get to inhabit this world and and play with it. And very much so with the MC2 stuff, with the Spider-Girl stuff, you know, we got to decide what we were going to keep from the 616 universe and what had evolved and what had changed and what didn't, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. And we got to be in our own little corner where nobody bothered us and we didn't have to be part of the summer crossover <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, and it was a pleasure, let me tell you. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> had a, we had a ball. We just the twelve issues. The twelve issues we did of Anax were some of the most fun I've ever had creatively. Partly because uh, Tom was editing the entire, you know, all three books, and you know, he had other things on his mind. So I got to, you know, he he was very open to whatever ideas I had. So there, you know, there were char- those were characters I cared about, and and we were playing with things like. Uh, you know the the sons the sons of the serpent from the old Avengers books back in the sixties. It was all about racism and how much better are we yet? <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't think the sons of the serpent would still have a branch somewhere? And <laughs> and Tom even militarized them and called them the soldiers of the serpent, and and that tied in with a you know I said boy that could be really cool to tie that in with the, the Seth character that we had in Thunderstrike being the serpent in the garden and everything, you know. Um, the only difference today would be that people would complain that the books are too political. And it's like <laughs> nothing has changed. I always laughed. I always laugh that off, though, because I, if I'm a lefty, Marvel contributed to that. <laughs> you know? Um, that's, that's all the, that, that's just part of what was going into Ron's gourd. So if you, you know, I, I would proudly say that I am a, you know, a liberal and a progressive. So uh, I may have just lost some readers there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if I, if, you know, if that's who I am and Stan and his crew contributed. To that, totally, you know? totally, um, totally. But it's, you know, I, yeah, the, the, the political side of it, I mean, because we, we did, we had... Uh, American dreams say that uh, most Americans are not uh, racists and don't want to hear about this crap and believe that America is stronger for its diversity. You know, we had her give that speech in, in an issue and and we had the crowd out in Times Square applauding it because it ended up on a monitor somewhere, you know, that kind of thing. So I, you know, they, they say the secret of life is something to love, something to love something to do and something to believe hmm. and i'm very lucky because the thing i love is also what i do so that's nice and if I, if you had if you nailed me down to a belief my belief is that most people are decent people most people are good yeah given the opportunity they're going to do the right thing groups of people what was the, the old line from the the first uh Men in black. Uh, uh, a know. person is smart. People a are dumb. Is <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, and I, I very much believe that. Um, we, we've, we've obviously hit upon the theme of collaboration a lot over this conversation here. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to hit on it one more time here. So, you know, given the passage of time and how that has contributed to just the, the, the dynamic and the communication styles between, you know, you and Tom and, you know, artists and writer. You know, we – there's a story. Tom, uh, Dan and I had uh, a guest on the show a few years ago. This, they, they wrote a very tight-knit run of comics, and they said – they revealed on our show, oh, actually, this is the very first time we've ever spoken to each other. Because, you know, with, with email and this and that, we could just do all this. And I got my floor, my, my jaw just dropped to the floor because I was like, how can you collaborate that tightly with that kind of dynamic? But it can be done now. So from your standpoint, you know, working through the years and, you know, kind of as technology has adapted and more, how, ha- how has that impacted your communication style, your dynamic? I mean, or has it? I mean, is it just made it easier? Has it has, has, has the 
techniques changed for you at all? Like, how does how has that contributed for you? It, I I don't see any any real difference. Ron and I just recently worked on on something together. Can we mention that? <laughs> You're talking about the 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 Infinity thing, yeah, or the or, or the Rebel Studios thing. The Infinity. Uh, I don't know. I don't, we we worked on two things together. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we just did one of those. Uh, I guess Marvel Unlimited has like a scrolling thing. Yeah, the the Infinity the scrolling movie. things. Yeah, they're the great. Infinity thing. We we did a, a two part a next you know short story for that, and uh, and then we also did an eight pager for for a new company that's starting up that uh, that Tom may still be working on. Not to derail the answer, but um, uh, they recently had a, uh, you know, Mayday Parker story on there. Were you guys approached about that? I mean, it's so different than anything you guys did that I was kind of astounded by it. uh, That, like, if they were going to bring it back for such a small thing, why not go to you guys? Yeah, because actually, Dan, if we can, I, I would love to know what the content was. So at some point, if you want to chat on private message or something, I would love to know because uh, I've, I've heard from a few fans who were not happy with it that there were some continuity glitches and things like that. But, you know, that's that's part of the biz, as Tom yeah. would say. Yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a whole new world. I think that um, if we came up with Spider-Girl today, I don't know if Ron and I would be... The, the guys assigned to do it, the, the, the people assigned to do it. I think for some reason, if the, if the character is a female character, they feel it has to be a female creative team. Um, and yet some of the best Punisher stuff I ever read was by people who were not male and were not serial indicted killers. For murder. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> And they were never indicted for murder. <laughs> oh, that we know yeah, of. <laughs> Some of the you know, best Hulk stories I've read were from people who didn't die from radiation poisoning. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, and, and, and I've often said I've never actually been convicted. People <laughs> often mistake an indictment for a conviction. No convictions. Well, we'll make sure we put that I, in the I, show I, notes, yeah. Tom. Well, <laughs> let's wait until... It, until actually, when is this show coming out? Because that, that might have changed by the time that happens. We've, we've got a few weeks still. Um, but uh, going back to the question about communication styles, so right. Tom, you're saying it hasn't really changed. Ron, do you feel the same? I would concur. I, I think it's easier now because we, one, we've completely cut out the fax machine, right? Um, and Tom can send me a you know an entire plot in an email, you know things like that. So those kind of things, that's fine. Uh, do he and I communicate a lot through email? No. Uh, <laughs> Do we occasionally uh, contact each other through private message or something? Sometimes, but mostly it's going to be a phone call because we're old school. Um, I there is a difference. I've I've noticed the difference these last few times we worked with Marvel that there's no phone calls with the editors anymore. Mm. It's all that's all through mm. now. Um, so sometimes it's a little harder to to get messages across and and uh, you know when you're talking about creative things or you know something as specific as coloring something or, sometimes it's hard to get your point across you know that kind of thing uh back and forth in an email so that can be frustrating uh the idea of not talking to an editor and not developing a relationship that way with an editor is very that's very foreign to me because of the era that I was working in Marvel. So that I've noticed that as a difference. Um, I, I've been working with inkers. Uh, I just did a project with Pat Olive where he inked it digitally. I sent him scans of the pencils and he inked it digitally. So the pencils exist and the inks only exist in cyberspace. Um, <laughs> Brett Breeding, on the other hand, when I work with him, he's outputting my pencils as blue lines and inking them on separate boards because he's been preferring to work that way, which, you know, mostly it only affects things in the artwork aftermarket. You know, it, it sometimes affects sales there. 
but you know it it's generally the same thing you know you're handing your stuff off in in my case i'm i'm just not dropping it fedex anymore i'm taking it home and scanning it and sending it via email to uh, to the anchor but uh, hmm. i mean so i would say in general i mean i'm always happy i don't have to fax things anymore because fax were a nightmare um uh, and it's it's you know it's better to scan reference and send it. You get you know, uh, more uh, accurate color from a scan than you do from the old uh, color Xeroxes. I remember at one point when we were doing first developing the Fantastic Five, and uh, the orange that I used on the thing when I zero when I made full color Xeroxes to send it as reference to the office, it darkened up where the, the colorist thought it was red and the mm. first pages on fantastic five came in and the thing was red and tom had to say no he's the same orange he always was and <laughs> it was good time, you know. apparently somebody thought he had gotten a sunburn in the last 15 years or something. but uh maybe maybe somebody so, painted yeah, I mean, uh, over the rock surface there you go yeah Alicia, Alicia went from uh, sculpting to, to, to painting her boyfriend. That, that's it, it. I mean, so I, as, like with anything, the tools make things a lot more convenient, you know, but you still need, I, I always still believe you need the, the brain and the hands to use the tools to their best, uh, uh, you know, to the, to the best of the, what am I trying to say? To the best of their utility. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, to answer the question, it, it's made things simpler, but I don't think it's intrinsically changed the way Tom and I actually do the work that we do. So, final question. Uh, what do you guys think was the most important lesson you learned about working together during your time on Amazing Spider-Man, if you can remember? Always listen to Ron. <laughs> I, I I think we, we we mentioned it earlier. Is um, you know, the, just be an idea factory with no ego attached to the ideas, and don't be married to any idea. Uh, so many times, um, I you know approach Ron. I had this brilliant idea for a story, and I. I thought to Ron, he said, yeah, that's pretty good. And we'd start talking about it. And then we get a bunch of other ideas. And the next thing I, I knew was we had a whole different story that had no connection whatsoever with the idea that started the thing. But what we ended up with was so much better than the idea that I, that I thought was such a brilliant thing to begin with. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, no Whoa. We, we the no ego thing is the most important thing to take away from this conversation if you're going to collaborate with somebody yeah. um i'm going to tell the story as quickly as i can i was called to my alma mater high school because one of the teachers who had actually been a fan as a kid and showed up at one of my uh, original uh, talks and all this kind of stuff was starting a comic book club and they, they had a large group of kids that were interested they were all going to divide up into groups of editors and uh, writers and pencilers and and creatives, and they were going to create they were they were going to create like four groups of 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 each of the jobs and create a comic book together. And then at the end of the year, they were going to present their finished comic book and blah blah blah. So I I was called in to give a general talk about the creative process which I did, and I also stressed, you know, the fact that you do your job as good as you can, you know, if you're handed a plot, if the editor has approved it, then your opinion is not needed, <laughs> and your job is to do the best job you can translating that visually, because that's your job. Then you pass it on to the next guy, to the next guy, to the next guy. And after I finished my talk, I had... A dozen kids separately come up to me and go, what, "What if I don't? What if I don't think the guy that's the editor? What if I don't think he knows what he's doing?" <laughs> I said, uh, 
<laughs> I said, uh, and what's your job? Uh, I'm the writer. I said, then uh, you man up and you listen to his ideas. And if something's better, you use it. And if not, you make your case. But if he's the editor, he gets final say. You know, and it was the same thing. I mean, pencilers were going, well, if I, what if I don't like the story I get handed? I said, do you want to be part of the project? Well, yeah. Well, then you draw the story you're given <laughs> to the best of your ability. And if you don't do it to the best of your ability, you're the problem. And, I mean, I've heard professional stories where guys were handed a plot and they turned into something completely different. Oh, yeah. Thinking that, what, the writer and the editor were going to get it back and think, hey, this is better. Let's print this. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's great. So that ego thing, it's, it's just amazing how quickly with somebody who sees themselves as creative, it's amazing how quickly that, that can kick in. And if, that is, if that's who you are, that's fine because a lot of real art is created by a singular person with a singular vision and a singular voice. I mean, that, that's completely legitimate. But... If this is what you sign on for, if working with other creatives is what you're signing on for, then, then, then try to make it creatives that you respect and creatives that you and uh, you know like their work and all this kind of. I mean, all of that's part of it, but you have to keep your ego out of it if you're going to do this for a living. That that's that's the biggest thing, and the biggest lesson that I learned from my run on Spider-Man. Um, is that if, if the creative team is having fun, so will the readers. Hmm. And if the creative team isn't having fun, if any one of them are just doing it by rote, if, if any of the one of them isn't committed and, and enjoying themselves, then I, I, I think that shows in the work. You know, but because even if it's none of our, none of our books were perfect, not a single one of them was, the, the pure, uncut perfection that is comics. How could they be? Mm -hmm. But the reason that we're still talking about it all these years later and the reason that, that you know certain issues that we did resonate and everything, because the people that read them had fun. Mm. It, we, we, we get the privilege of being a part of their personal nostalgia. And, and, and they enjoyed it. And, but I think the enjoyment that, they, that anybody gets from our work comes from the fact that we are enjoying doing the work. And if Tom doesn't agree with that, then I never want to see him again. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I believe in my heart that you give me two, two or three more years of this stuff and I'll finally start to get good at it. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I need that because I'm two or three years away. Um, I, that, that's an important part of any creative process, though. If you think you've arrived, which is also one of the things that feeds ego, because if you think you've arrived and you don't think your partners, your creative partners, you know, are as good as you, that's where a lot of ego is going to yeah. come from. But if you think you've arrived, find something else to do. It's funny you say this because I've been I... cutting Mark out of the podcast for years. <laughs> no. You wish. If I, get to, if I get to the point where I've learned everything I need to know about making the perfect comic book and, uh, and, and the only thing holding me back are idiots, then it's time to move on. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, well, yeah, but I would never think that. Um, yes, you're an idiot, but you're not a destructive idiot. You're not an idiot that's holding me back. You're an idiot that rises me up. <laughs> I, I, I've had discussions with a lot of uh, self-proclaimed geniuses um, who are writers, and, and they're constantly complaining that the pencilers are not giving them you know, uh, are, are not, you know, giving their their stories the attention or, or, or delicacy that they, they deserve. And I've said, well, then maybe, you know, maybe comic books are not for you. Maybe you should just be writing prose. Yeah. Because, um, you know, sometimes you get an idea that works, you know, is only going to work in prose. Um, so you should, 
should just do pros then. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, or, or just get an AI program. Oh and no! And make sure that your story. Make sure that your stories are about six fingered and seven fingered people. You know. <laughs> so someone at work who brought that up, they're like, "Oh, we should invest in Chat GP." I'm like, "Do you want to put me out of a job? What is wrong with you? <laughs> no, <laughs> we're not doing no, AI that's AI tool. narratives." <laughs> So, uh, you know, Tom, you said it's going to take you two to three years to get good at this thing. Um, and so, like, I'm guessing what are you working on now? If you can say anything, you alluded to stuff earlier. Is, is there anything you guys have that's recently out that is coming out soon that you could plug here uh, before we send you on your way? Well, we do have a, a two part a next story coming in the Avengers Infinity thing. Um, and I, I get the impression that'll be out in a couple of weeks. Mm. Um, uh, Pat Olive and I are working on a four issue limited series for Marvel, which um, is an odd one. Um, <laughs> and and uh, I, I don't know when they're going to announce that. So I can just tell you, keep, keep your eyes peeled because, um, <laughs> be, because we, we, we do something we actually have a lot of action in this comic book uh, and characterization and uh, and heart um, and we stick more in four issues than they normally do in 12 um, and I and I have a hunch that uh, people who like our stuff uh, will enjoy this um, you know Ron and I and and, and uh, Pat and I have also done some some material for another new publisher who's not ready to announce this stuff yet. Um, and, and when they are, it'll come out. And and I still do Archie stuff because they ask me to do a lot of stuff and shove it into a five-page story. And it's such a creative challenge that I just can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> really great. Um, Ron, how about you? Well, I'm still working with uh, Darren Henry and Sit Comics, doing the Blue Baron. Uh, I'm, I'm pledged to, uh, you know, clean up my schedule a little bit more and uh, and produce more regularly for Darren. Uh, so I'm still very much involved in that and uh, I'm doing commissions through CatskillComics.com. And occasionally, when I get an offer that I can't refuse, of like an a next thing or a character i care about or something like that uh you know i I'll, I'll make the time to do it but uh at this point i'm pretty content doing blue baron and, and commissions i've got commissions to keep me busy until i'm old and gray so uh and i'm not gray yet so there you go <laughs> and, and i'll plug ron yeah, yeah. for you i'll plug your facebook page which i think has been really awesome and exciting um to kind of keep up with all of the new art that you've been doing um so uh if yeah i usually i, I usually try to, to do previews when i feel it's appropriate i do previews of stuff that's that, that, that's going to be coming out and you know it's frustrating because i don't know where where the where you can really get everybody's ear anymore yeah. to let them know that things are coming up. But that's one of the reasons I joined Facebook is I saw Pat Olaf was using it to let people know he was still alive and still producing. <laughs> so that's what I use it for as well. Our daily check-in that Ron is still breathing. So there we uh, go. <laughs> Proof of life. Very exciting. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. Well, hey guys, uh, thank you so much. You know, for for coming back on the show. You know, we're about to cross over the threshold of doing this for ten years, and uh, you know, one of the best things that we've gotten out of those ten years, I think, is like making relationships uh, and uh, with different creators. And you guys were amongst the first people we ever talked to on the show, and. I know it really set us on the right path with like, uh, you know, how we could approach these kind of things and, and what we could expect from, you know, creators, uh, you know, in terms of input and, and also just how much you guys were really warm to us all, all the way back at, uh, Connecticut or Connecticut, whatever they used to call it, uh, you know, a decade ago. So, uh, thank you again for, for all the support you've given our show over the years. It's all your fault. <laughs> I, I, I know you have a. I know you. 
You got a cool logo, Inked by Sal Basella. I mean, I know yeah, no, trust me. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, get, I get mail about that like every week, how we have the coolest logo in, in podcasts. So, uh, you know, I do, I do owe that to you, Ron, and, and Sal. Uh, it's been a pleasure from the very beginning. Happy anniversary when the 10 years does roll around. And uh, you've always been, I've said it before on my Facebook page, and I'll say it again, you've always been one of the smarter, uh, more insightful Spider-Man podcasts out there. So, uh, you know, you, you, you've earned your bones. There's no doubt about that. Nobody did it for you. Well, thank you. either way, thank you both. Uh, and uh, we can't wait to talk to you again. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Guys. Thank you. Take care, Mark. Take you care. Got it. All right. Thanks again to the legendary Tom DeFalco. And as Mark said, the equally legendary Ron friends for coming back on our show. Like I said, we've talked to Tom and Ron a number of times over the years. So if you want to hear more, I cannot encourage you enough to dig through our catalog and our back issues to hear more. We have, you know, I think two or three interviews with Tom and probably a half dozen to a dozen with Ron. <laughs> so, you know, there's plenty of more where that came from. If you enjoyed what we just talked about today, but we're at the end of the show. So Mark, why don't you bring things to a close? Hoo ha. Well, it's that time time for all good things to come to an end. So we want to say thank you to you, the listeners and viewers for tuning into this episode of the amazing spider talk. Yeah, this podcast exists because of listener support on Patreon. For only $3.99 a month, you can help support our show's existence while getting early episodes, including the reviews that we do of the new comics, this interview with Tom and Ron, you'll get exclusive artwork, and a ton of other bonuses. So, you know, it's an awesome thing to check out. You can go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and click on the big Patreon button and it will guide you there. And as I say every week... A thank you to everyone who already supports us and all that we do for making it possible. To download our earliest episodes, including interviews with creators like J.M. DeMatteis, Tom DeFalco, Ron Friends, Mark Bagley, and more, subscribe to our Amazing Spider Talk Back Issues podcast on Apple Podcasts. So, Mark, until Jim Owsley shows up in our podcasting booth and ends our partnership on Amazing Spider Talk, what's our motto? Wow, that, that, that's a dark turn, Dan. Uh, with great podcasts, there must also come the amazing spider talk. 